stop, reset. Oh, let me get comfortable here. <sighs> Start. Welcome back to the channel. I don't think I've done a great job thanking you for, for participating in this channel. Without you, there is no Milner YouTube channel. You've sent questions, you've offered criticism, both positive and negative, and you've participated in this channel. So if I haven't done a good job in thanking you, I wanna take the time to do that now. So thank you for doing that. I have no idea where this channel is going. It could end tomorrow or it could continue for the foreseeable future. I don't really know. But for now, and if you haven't noticed, I've been a filmmaking machine over the last week and my wife disappeared for the afternoon. And so I thought, you know what? I better take advantage. For those of you who used to listen to my audio podcast for what it's worth, who wrote me and said, I really wish you were still doing that podcast, you may like today's Q&A because this is gonna be called thoughts and answers, not Q&A, because I'm gonna mix in some of what I would have done on For What It's Worth. And for those of you who don't know, it was an audio podcast where I talked about random subjects, typically about 10 or 12 random subjects each time. Each podcast was about an hour long, so it was quite a bit of pro programming, even though I only did like 51 or 52 uh, episodes. But I have gotten more great questions, but I've also, I keep running into ideas or themes that pop up around photography or bookmaking or industry related things that I think might be helpful. And I might throw a story or two in here and I'm gonna throw a story in here uh, at the beginning just for fun because my photography life has been filled with some really funny, not so funny things. But before we go any further, I wanted to, to uh, discuss something about photography and that's time and access. There is no substitute if you're doing documentary work especially. There is no substitute for time and access. The more of those two things you have, the better your work will be. If you cut time in the field or access, your work will suffer and it will not be that good. And that's true for every single photographer in the world. The only way that that flips and then you're going from documentary to photojournalism is if something traumatic happens and you happen to be standing there and it happens very quickly and it's there and gone and you get it, that can be one thing. But most of us are working on projects over a long period of time and time and access are two things. If you are trying to get better at photography and your goal is to share things immediately as you're doing this with things like Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, you know, whatever, Pinterest, my belief is that you will not get any better. You will only get to a certain level and that level is capped at the bottom of those social networks. I just don't see people learning photography that way and getting better. What you will be learning to be is a content creator and not a photographer. And I put photography in a different category, whether it's considered better or worse is up to you, but it's different. And photography takes a lot, it's a lot harder to do, it's a lot more rare, and it's not content. It's a level above content. And if your inspiration is to do what you see on Instagram, you're gonna be a content creator, not a photographer. And there's a difference. And some people are perfectly happy being one or the other. Some people dabble in both, but that's kind of my thing. Time, good photography is very rare and it takes a lot of time to do it. And we're living in a culture and a world in a business climate that really is doing everything it can to limit time in the field, limit budgets, and also limit the public's consumption of what an image is. Re remember now, if an image is two weeks old, it's considered mature. I think it's actually much shorter time than that. I think an image can be mature within 24 hours. Even if something goes viral, it can die in 24 hours and people are just ready for something else. It doesn't bode well for the long-term um, long aspects of photography. The second point I wanna make is that photography is actually a very solitary pursuit. When I got out of high school, I was, I was directionless. And my father, who was a business guy, was completely and utterly frustrated with yours truly. So frustrated that he decided to take me to this just arcane, awful sort of job testing facility where they basically put you in a room for about three and a half hours and you had to take this very comprehensive test and it was supposed to highlight what you should do for a living. The guy, the, the guy who was giving me the test looked like he was from the 1950s and you know the, the pocket protector and the brill cream and the buzz cut and like no sense of humor. And uh, when he got done with the test, he came in the room and he, he was shaking his head. And I knew that I, I bested him when he was shaking his head. And he goes, I've never seen anything like this. I've never seen test results like this. Everything on my testing was at the bottom. Every career was just down here below even the level of, that, of the lowest level of the test. 
and there were two things all the way at the top and there was nothing in between. Most of the time people's sort of, their chart sort of went like this. And mine just had a line at the top and a line at the bottom. And the two things at the top were number one was private investigator and number two was photojournalist. And the guy's like, I've never seen anyone test so independently as this kid, meaning me, which made my father even, even worse. He was even more pissed at me after that. But the point is, it's a solitary career. Even if you're in the field doing documentary work and you're working with people, ultimately it's a solitary thing because you're in your mind so much when you're working and you're so focused on the pieces of the chess field and uh, chess and the playing board in front of you that even though you're talking and you're interacting, you're often completely and utterly lost in your own head. So if you are gonna be a photographer, that's something to think about. See how this is? We're just working our way in here. Okay, um, I just ate three bean burritos, by the way. So I'm a bit sluggish at the moment. I should have had some chai, but I couldn't get around to it. I'm gonna tell a little story here. God, I can't even, I just misspelled. I misspelled my story title header. That's not good when it's your own story. When I was in photojournalism school, and there is absolutely no point to this story other than telling you a story, and we're only six and a half minutes in. <clears throat> when I went to photojournalism school, what you had, when you got later into the sequence, like into the third year and the fourth year, primarily what you did was work on projects. And you had to come up with a project idea, then you had to write a proposal, and you had to write and propose the entire full circle of that project. This is the story, this is how I'm gonna do it, this is how I'm gonna print it, this is how it's gonna end up. It's, I would come up with story ideas, and then I would propose, write the proposal, and then I would take it to the head of the department who would then look at you and say, you're an idiot or you're a genius. Most of the time he told me I was an idiot. The story in question was, I had an old Land Cruiser and I had a police scanner. And I would drive to the center of town and the, the town was split by a big highway and the west side was the university and the east side at the time was gangland. And I would sit with that police radio and calls would come across primarily from the east side of the city. Shootings, fires, domestic violence, um, auto theft, whatever. And I would roll on those with my police scanner. I had no real idea what I was doing. I just knew I wanted to do it. It was exciting, it was fun, it was in the middle of the night. And I began to roll up on these crime scenes and I got to know the fire department and I got to know a lot of the police, the first responders and the cops that were coming in there to take care of these situations. And they thought it was kind of a novelty that I was a student and I was covering these things. That's how I met the, the fire department chief photographer. We became friends. And that's how I also met the gang unit from the police department. So I had this beautiful idea that I was gonna suddenly ride around with the gang unit. So I wrote this proposal and I said, this is what I'm gonna do. And I'm gonna ride around with these guys and I'm gonna show like the city is filled with gangs. And I don't know what I was doing, but that was in theory what I was after. And I, got, I remember I got an F on the proposal because the head of the faculty was like, you're an idiot. No one is gonna allow you to ride around with them. And I was like, I don't know about that. So I drove over to the police station and I just walked in and said, uh, can I talk to the gang unit? And they were like, go that way. So I go down there, there's four guys in a room. And I go, hey, I'm a student at the school. I'm a photojournalist. I'm really interested in what you're doing. Can I ride around with you? And the guy literally picks up a form and he goes, here, just sign this uh, that says your parents can't sue us if you get killed. And then you can ride around with this. And I was like, oh, great. So I signed it. And literally that night I was riding around from like five o'clock at night till five in the morning. I would ride with the gang unit. And it was a blast. It was everything I wanted it to be, even though it was... It was a, a lesson in sociology. It was a lesson in socioeconomic income, gang life, um, privilege, not privilege. It just went on and on. It was, a, it was an incredible learning experience. Some of the guys in the car in, in the team liked me and other guys did not like me and did not want me to be there and got in my face and said, don't take pictures of me. I don't believe you should be here. I don't want you here, et cetera. It was kind of, it was a rough sort of patch depending on who was in the car. But the story that I want to tell you is that we are in, in south of town and we pull into a apartment complex and the, I said, what are we doing? And the guy said, we're staking out that car. It's a stolen car. And when the gang member who stole it comes out, we're gonna chase him and arrest him. And I said, well, that's ironic because I live in the apartment complex right across the street. And the two guys in the car turned around and looked at me and they go, you don't actually live here, do you? And I go, yeah, that's my apartment right there. And I remember they both looked at me and they were like, you gotta move, this is a horrible neighborhood. And I'm like, well, it's cheap and my buddies are there. And you know, it was fine. It was, it was true, it was a horrible neighborhood. We're staking out this car. And all of a sudden there's a, a, a call that goes over the radio that I wanna say was a code three, 
meaning every available unit in the city descend on X location as fast as humanly possible. So we bail from the staking out the stolen car and we are now headed to another location in the, further south in the city and we are going at top speed. So it's a black Ford LTD blacked out. All the chrome is gone. The windows are totally tinted black and the back windows where I am don't roll down because that's where the perps ride. So I'm in the back and there's a steel mesh between myself and the driver and the passenger. So there's two cops and me and I'm in the back seat. And the back seat's kind of cramped because all the plastic and the mesh and how they've sort of built everything up in the car, it's not like a regular Ford LTD, it's a little bit tighter. And if we were gonna arrest a perp, then I'd be in the back seat with the perp, so not optimal. We hit the freeway. It's the middle of the night. It's like two in the morning. And we hit the freeway and go all the way over to the fast lane. And we're and it's one of those old Ford LTDs that has the needle uh, speedometer, right? Which we haven't had in like 30 years, but the, there's a needle. So I'm sitting there looking at the speedometer and it stops at like 120. And so we're pegged in 120 and we're going down the freeway and way up in the distance, I see this car getting on the freeway. It's the only car I could see in either direction. And he comes on like this. All he had to do was stay in the slow lane or the middle lane or the next lane because we're in the fast lane and rightly so because we're going really fast. And this guy just keeps coming. And the driver, the cop that's driving our car realizes this and just like touches the brakes. But you're going so fast that we laid down, I think it was, I don't know what it was, 500 and some feet of skid marks and just went and just plowed into this car. And our car just like spins. I, I eat this steel mesh in front of me, right? I have no seatbelt on. I just slam into that thing and the car just, blow, all the tires blow out, the front end's gone. We spin around in a circle. That car, that car was actually not too bad. I don't think it was drivable, but there were people inside. No one was injured uh, except my face on the, um, on the metal screen. But I was like, whoa, that was not planned and uh, kind of dramatic. And long story short, that, and that story didn't go away. That sort of scenario, what went down, went on, got into the legal system or whatever. Uh, I had to testify, to do a bunch of other stuff. What did we do? I swear we went back and we got another car and we went on another stakeout and got in another high-speed chase that same night. And I was like, I'm hooked. This is all I wanna do for the rest of my life. So, and I don't think I made a single picture that night. I don't think I did because there was nothing to make a picture of. I was stuck in the back seat of this car with blacked out windows. You couldn't see in, in, or, in or out. It was not, not, a, not a fun place to be. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. All right, let's get to some of these questions. How, this is a really good one. How do you choose what books to buy? And that meaning, meaning photo books. And th this is a great question because the answer might rub you the wrong way. And this first question is directly related to the second question, which is also probably gonna rub you the wrong way and might be a little tough love. As you've seen in my house already, I have a long string of books from here all the way down there. There's a couple hundred books there, and there's a bunch here, and there's a bunch in this other room. Now, the short answer to this, and the answer that you're probably expecting is, well, I just buy the books that I like, and I, the ones that have all the great photographs. But that's not really true, because there are more than a few books on this shelf that are beautiful books filled with terrible photographs. Let me repeat that. There are a lot of books, not a lot. There's, there's more than a few on these shelves. Beautiful book, terrible photographs. And some of those beautiful books, terrible photographs are by very well-known photographers who happen most of the time to be friends. I have bought more than a few books that were done by friends that are terrible photography books because the projects were terrible. And the reason they got the book was because they have a name. And this is all tied into these first, these first two questions are tied in. This is about business. This is about capitalism. This is about an industry, about a name, and about the commerce that transpires around a brand or a name. A photographer as a brand, if they've reached that certain level, they're a brand. A photographer, let's say, does a, does a project when they're, when they're younger. It's a great body of photographs. They get a book deal. Maybe they're able to follow that up with a second project that's maybe almost as good, but not quite. But everyone says, wow, those are great. Once that happens, if the industry looks around and says, this is a cash cow, we can, we can bank on this person, they will do book after book after book if, it makes, if they can make money on it. So I have... I know a lot of photographers who did great books followed by strings of not so great books. And I like to support my friends regardless of whether or not the book is something that I think is worthy of being a book. 
Nowadays, we have self-publishing, which by the way, was around before there was traditional publishing. I'm actually writing a blog post about this right now. People were self-publishing before they were publishing, but now we have photo book publishing. So you have traditional publishers and you have a lot of people who are self-publishing. The downside of self-publishing is that anybody can make a book. So consequently, there's a lot of bad books. But what publishers don't want you to know is they're publishing a lot of bad books as well. So the beautiful books with the bad photographs that I'm telling you about, these were done by traditional publishers. These are people that invested with acquisitions editors and designers and marketers and distributors who put these books out into the world even though they're bad books. So again, beautiful book, bad photographs. I see this all the time. I see, and I see beautiful books, bad photographs selling out because once a book gets hot, people will buy it to collect it just to have it. The same thing applies for photographs, still, still photographs in a gallery scenario. How many collectors have I talked to that when I ask what they bought, they said, I bought whatever the curator told me to buy. The curator said, this person's gonna be good, that person's going up in value. Yeah, I bought them and I warehoused them and I'll never see them, but you know what, they're investments. That happens all the time. So that's my book scenario. I buy books that I love the photographs and I think, holy cow, this person just like did something remarkable. And then I also buy books because I'm supporting people for a variety of different reasons. And this brings me to the second question and then I'm gonna end and I'm gonna start another Q&A, even though we've only done two questions, but these are really important. The second question is, how do you feel about going from amateur to pro? I've talked about this before, but there's wrinkles involved here that I want to go over because there, there are two things that are happening all the time with people reaching out to me. Number one is, I've said for a long time, and I, I didn't feel this way going way back, but I've felt it for the last decade, is you're better off being an amateur photographer than you are professional. I think most of the professional photographers I know now, not all, but many, are struggling, they're unhappy, and they're facing an industry that is in serious trouble. I think COVID made it exponentially worse. I think most of the successful commercial photographers I know during COVID were down 50 to 75%. But I think a lot of consumers look at being a professional photographer and they envision themselves being a professional down in some, some point down the line and they envision this world that doesn't exist. They never envision what it's gonna take to get from where they are now to that dreamland. There seems to be this massive jump and disconnect from A to B. And I'm like, that fan first of all, that's a fantasy land that you're living in, that you're looking at. And two, to get from where you are now to there is gonna take a long time and a lot of work and a lot of luck. So <clears throat> if you're willing to do that, go for it. Don't let me dis discourage you. If you are one of those people bent on being a professional photographer, then I say go for it and do it. Like prove me wrong. But you better envision what it's gonna take to get there. And let me, let me finish this, this episode with the second part of that, which is there, there are a lot of amateur photographers and some pros who feel that there is some sort of sacred aspect of professional photography, that there is this up righteous place where everything is perfect and there's nothing nefarious about anything going on and that everything about them is sacred and the industry is sacred and their work is sacred, that is complete and total BS. My father used to say something to me all the time to my brother and sister, and we, we, it drove us nuts because he would say it all the time. We would, we would pull something like this where we would try to, to, to put a sort of sacredness on something that we wanted to believe was that way. And my father was like, ain't no such thing as a free lunch. Ain't no such thing as a free lunch. So for all of you out there who are envisioning to become professionals, looking at professional photography as some sort of sacred ground, that is pure delusion because everybody is paying for something. Nothing happens in photography a book deal, a gallery show, a museum show, a collection happening, nothing happens without someone or something paying for it. A brand, an NGO, an institution, something, a person, everything, there is an angle behind everything because we live in a capitalistic society and photography is a business. This is not something they taught me in school and I feel I was actually really ticked about this the later, the further I got into photography and the, and the more I realized how little I knew about business, I was like, wow, they did not prepare me to be a photographer. They maybe kind of aimed me in the right direction on how to make a picture, but this is 90% business. So for people to think that there is some sort of 
secret sauce that means that you're going to put something out into the world without paying for it or having someone else pay for it, a brand pay for it, then you are in for a rude awakening. There is nothing sacred. And the last thing I'll say is there's a lot of talk about when it comes to being a professional about what does that actually mean? And I've mentioned this many times before about there sort of being parallel industries. There's the online community of photography and then there's the brick and mortar commercial photography world, which would be like photojournalism, editorial, commercial, fashion, advertising, automotive, fine art, that, that's all on the commercial side. And then you have the online world, which is social media and like things like YouTube. If you think that being a professional means doing a brand association on Instagram, or let's say, for example, you a brand reaches out and says, we want you to do a static post on IG, and we want an IG story, and we want a YouTube film, we're gonna pay you X amount. If that is your definition of professional photography, you are in the online photography world. If you are doing a commercial assignment for a brand working with an art director from an agency and going on set with the client and models and talent and catering, you're probably in the commercial side. If you're shooting a campaign for Ford and you're going to Morocco at sunrise, to shoot these new Ford cars going through, I don't know, the Atlas Mountains, that's, you're on the commercial side of photography. Now, these are two very different worlds. Oddly enough, the online photography community is filled with people that have virtually no training. That makes no difference anymore at all. If I had to say which side of this equation was going up and down, I would say, the relevance of the online photography world is going up and the relevance of the brick and mortar world is going down. And, there's, and that's both a good thing and a very bad thing. The one of the reasons this is going down is because this is a legitimate system that requires, almost requires legitimate players. It's more complicated, it's more expensive, it's stickier, it's more time consuming. It's looked at more closely. The work needs to last longer. The work needs to be better. This is a free-for-all. This world is the Wild West. There are people asking for and getting money on the Instagram front in terms of brand associations that are doing individual posts or motion posts or whatever. They are asking for and getting comedy circus money because this is now about metrics. This is When you're going to meetings and you talk to, talk to people about working with photographers in this space, very rarely does the work ever come into the conversation. This is about metrics. It's about geographic location, number of followers, demographics of followers, return on investment through that channel. But everything that's put out is gone in a heartbeat. It's launched, the campaigns are launched, and two days later, it's already out of people's minds and they've moved on and they're looking for the next round. And this is crazy because when they talk about micro-influencers, you're talking about people that may have 500 followers on Instagram, but because of the metrics, they are now suddenly viable for a brand. So it's weird and it has nothing to do with quality of photography or training. It never even comes into the conversation. Whereas on this side of the table, it's a whole different scenario. If you are landing a big, let's say that you are a commercial producer that is a still photographer, a motion person, and also a producer that can have a production crew at their disposal to work on a commercial shoot, you have to wear four or five hats and you have to be good because when that client shows up and you can't tell that your, your creative fee is too small and you can't tell that your production fee is too small, meaning that you're gonna have to dip into your creative fee to cover your butt on your production fee, <clears throat> clients know that. The agent and the art buyer and the people in between also know that. And so there's a whole like, it's a, it's a system, a community, a hierarchy, it's complicated. It can be amazing for certain people and a nightmare for others, but these are two totally different things. To me, they're both totally viable now because that's just the world we live in. This is completely viable because people's attention spans are so short and they're on social media all day. So it's like, it makes sense to go after and work with people like this, but you cannot say that the work that they're creating is the same as this group over here. This is the kind of work, and I, I would say again, photography and content. Photography is the kind of work that is made every now and then that's sort of seared into the history of our medium and people are like, wow, this advertising campaign that was done in the 90s changed advertising and here it is. And there were only six of those that happened in the 1990s and they're at that level and everyone looks and says, wow, they win all the advertising awards, they win the photography awards, but over here is going 150 miles an hour and it's just spitting stuff out all the time. The good side of this 
is that it's allowed a lot of people who didn't have the ability to go to art school or didn't have the funding to go to art school or the privilege to go to art school that went out and self-taught and said, look, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get a toehold here and I'm gonna be tenacious and hang on and find a way to make money with photography. So it's a weird, it's a weird shift. And I think I don't see that ever going away and maybe it shouldn't go away. I think it's gonna be a perpetual uh, dance between the online photo world and the brick and mortar photo, photo world. And I don't know where it's heading. I hope more than anything else that it is headed in a healthy, sustainable direction for people to survive and make a living. And when I, this next q and I'm gonna talk about what I think some of the things associated with being a professional actually are, which might be a surprise to you. And I think that will be a good question. I know we only did two questions, but I think that was a bunch of decent information about photography. And if I'm wrong, again, I've said this every single time I've done one of these, I'm one person with one opinion. I've had one set of observations. In my life, you may agree with me, you may not. That was this week's thought and answers. Deep thoughts with Stuart Smalley. If you were a tree, what kind of tree would you be? I will be back right now with another episode.